Hello, and welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm Christina Passariello, technology editor here at The Post. I'm delighted to be hosting this two-part series today about the future of money. My first guest today, Max Levchin, is the founder and CEO of a firm and was one of the co-founders of PayPal. Max, welcome to Washington Post Live. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited about this conversation today. Spending is so top of mind for many people right now, especially heading into the holiday period. And it feels like we have seen just kind of unprecedented um, disruption in the last year and a half because of the pandemic, um, supply chain woes, everything that's happening with inflation and the job market. So there's a lot to cover today. Um, my first question for you is really just how you see holiday buying going into this season with all of those different factors in play. You know, it's a, a fascinating question, and I will not pretend to have any anything rem remotely resembling a crystal ball here. Uh, the one thing that I can definitively say, it won't be like other years, and I think that that's exactly what I would have said about 2020. The shape of the ramp up of spending typically heading into the holiday buying kind of culminating with the uh five days around black friday cyber monday is really different this year and it was last year in part because consumers were and still are largely confined to online buying certainly last year and you know things are opening up a little bit right now as a result retailers shifted a lot of their promotions to an earlier timeline they also employed other different kinds of marketing channels. And so you see a steeper slope in the earlier parts of the uh, third, fourth um, calendar quarter. And so we, we saw things resembling Christmas sales begin literally in late August, September, which is just completely different from other years. And so the, the big question is, will the consumer still have this sort of final blowout shopping week you know, coming up in a few days? Or have a lot of those dollars been already put to work in the, uh, in the preceding months? Um, I, I don't think anyone can predict truly um, the thing that we can be and we are is to be prepared for uh, for, for consumer demand. Uh, most recent economic numbers suggest that demand is not slowing down, which is good news for our retail partners and uh, good news for the U.S. economy. Absolutely. And um, so interesting to see people doing holiday shopping and essentially the summer. Um, I guess they might get their packages on time. Uh, let me ask you a little bit more about inflation. Uh, what kinds of effects are you seeing on consumers um, around inflation? Do you sense that there are concerns um, and that consumers are more sensitive to uh, the rising prices in different categories? Again, pretty hard to tell. We survey our consumers all the time. Generally speaking, both the conversations around rising rates, the interest rates, and inflation kind of in the same sentence, even though they're directly opposite of each other in terms of you know what, what, what it's for um seem to drive demand for financing which is obviously our business so we, we care a lot about it and we are noticing more consumers interested in using buy not pay later interested in figuring out how you know, what alternatives exist to sort of traditional credit cards um i don't believe we've seen anything suggesting that consumers are opting out of shopping while tracking the uh, inflation news that's really interesting. One of the other effects that we've seen from the pandemic is, you know, certain populations of people really kind of increasing their spending and um, and doing quite coming out of the pandemic quite well financially. Whereas we're seeing other populations who've really been hit very hard by the pandemic, um, by the disruption in the job market. How does that affect um, how you see the business uh, at a firm and the kinds of demand for buy now, pay later? Again, I think the powerful thing about consumer credit business, and in particular our take on it, is that it is acyclic. During great economic times, consumers seek out especially compelling deals and um, increase their spending, increase their shopping, and a firm is there to help because a huge part of our value add to the merchant community is we allow them to create these really compelling promotions that are rooted in total transparency, consumers know exactly what they're paying, but they're getting a great deal because many times the retailer or the manufacturer is able to deliver a true interest-free transaction for them, even though they are paying over time. So in better economic times, we see that fuel demand for our product. In a 
less certain ones, e.g. the beginning of the pandemic or people who have lost their jobs or, and are just now coming out of the pandemic period trying to uh, make sure that their cash flow is managed well, they come to us for the responsible intelligent access to capital and paying for things over time. Promotions are less relevant for them. What they really care about is making sure that their monthly spend does not overwhelm their uh, monthly um, ability to, to earn. Mm -hmm. um, I'd love to hear you uh, expand a little bit about people who are part of the great resignation, because we've seen the record numbers of people quitting their jobs in recent months. So for people who have been quitting um, their jobs, you know, who are part of this great resignation, how are you seeing that affect their spending? No, I think that is too early to tell. And this is, you're, you're now pushing my macroeconomic uh, ability to prognosticate uh, probably to its limits. Um, I think a fair number of these folks are considering other careers. I think the pandemic experience really gave them a sense for just what it's like to live a very different life inadvertently. I'm not, not sure they had a lot of choice in the matter, but a number of people we spoke with that have resigned, and this is obviously very important for us, both from the consumer spending and sort of repayment capability, as well as just as an employer, we have 2000 firmers working here and uh, we care a lot about hiring the next 2000 and continue to grow our, our workforce. And there are plenty of people we talk to that say things like, you know what, I've realized during this year that actually I'm not really in the line of work I want to be. And so I think there's a fair amount of transitioning, I hope, but this is not rooted in research, that a large percentage of these people take advantage of tremendous amount of educational resources available online. If you're stuck on your couch or behind your home office, there's an ample opportunity to pick up new skills and join the digital economy for those that haven't yet. And I think that that's a that's the hopeful take on it. Uh, what ultimately happens, we'll see, I think, 18, 24 months from now. Yeah, so interesting. You have a really interesting personal tale about your own financial backstory. Can you just tell us a little bit about why you were personally motivated to found a firm? Uh, sure, uh, it, it's, a, it's a cautionary tale. So I came to the United States as an immigrant uh, at 16 from what is now known as Ukraine, uh, not the Ukraine, despite uh, the occasional uh, mischaracterization. But I, of course, I was born and raised in Soviet Union and came here right before college, went to my favorite place in the world, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, where I very luckily overlapped with a handful of people that had a hand in building the web and so was thrust into the opportunity. Uh, but before that happened, I took out my first student credit card right there on campus and attempted to start a company and finance it from my student credit card. The company didn't work. I wrecked my credit rating, started a few more companies, eventually co-founded PayPal, which made me most certainly quite financially independent, but did nothing for my credit rating. And so even 10 years into sort of the long past the PayPal journey, I would flinch when I would give my credit card to a, uh, you know, a, a cashier or, or uh, somebody you know, bringing me my restaurant bill because I wasn't really sure if I'd get declined. My credit was still destroyed from the uh, two facts of one, coming to the US with no credit history whatsoever and to just having a misstep when I was young and was still learning the ropes of uh, financial responsibility. Some of that stayed with me until today. And uh, 10 years ago, I read the study that described how millennial generation is opting out of credit cards and preferring debit cards. And literally almost those terms describe this notion of embarrassment, distaste for credit cards, being declined, not really knowing exactly how much credit you have and what it will cost, all rooted in the experience of their parents whose homes had to be sold short and who you know, some people had to declare bankruptcies during the financial crisis. And so this idea of like, I know exactly what this feels like, even though I'm you know, generation uh, older than the millennials, gave me this idea that maybe we should build an alternative to credit cards that is built around the sense of transparency and clarity as, as you know, both what can you spend, exactly what it will cost, exactly what isn't isn't good for you financially. And that this is the creation sort of, uh, normally I'd say creation myth, except this is a true creation reality of a firm. I was chatting with some of my old PayPal uh, so, uh, conspirators and recalling the uh, days when I had to pay cash for my first car after PayPal went public, even though wow. I, I thought 
should have done by then, but would have been okay to uh, to lend money to. And so th this is where a firm came from. And I have a great deal of empathy for folks that are opting out of credit cards because they know it might hurt them, which it certainly did with me. That's it's so interesting. Um, it's it's just fascinating, and I think so many people can relate to that. Uh, you know, the the credit score hanging over them for a long time. And of course, I know that a firm looks beyond credit scores to evaluate potential customers. Um, but as you point out, like credit scores still hold so much sway over people's ability to spend, and in many cases, like exacerbate inequalities. So. Why is it so difficult to move beyond the prevalence of credit scores? Like, why are they still so important um, in our financial system? So first of all, credit scoring is really, really difficult. It is not a thing that you can sort of just get better at very quickly. And so that I have a healthy degree of uh, respect for everyone in, in our industry who is very conservative. A firm manages credit very carefully as well. We, we are a risk management organization as well as a technology company. Um, we took the trouble starting 10 years ago to build our own credit scoring engine from the ground up. And the, the original thesis behind the company really was, you know, cast your mind back to uh, you know, now 30 years ago, Max, in his uh, late teens, try to figure out how to uh, this whole thing works. I didn't know what minimum payments were. I, my behavior was sort of erratic and there was no history. So looking at that and discerning that this person also had a computer science degree from one of the top computer science schools and very employable, and in fact, likely to probably make ends meet just fine. So looking for those signals that someone isn't just a cookie cutter case of, well, that's a thin file as they call it in the industry. So no credit for you was something that really was very, very important to us. The sort of to, to break it down a little bit, there's a handful of things that you have to do when you are in a credit business. First of all, you have to make sure that the consumer borrowing the money is in line to you, which is to say if they're using someone else's identity or perhaps they're saying, yes, I would love to borrow a thousand dollars and I have no intention to pay you back. That, that's a bad thing. We, we try to figure out how to spot that behavior and uh, prevent those folks from transacting with us. There's the second group, which is actually larger, and that's the group that is lying to themselves. They're looking at their personal financial situation through rose-colored glasses and basically say, you know what, I'll probably win the lottery and that's how I'll be able to pay this back or, or a variant of that thought. And that can be predicted in a sense that you can look at someone's state of financial life and determine whether the credit load that they're trying to take on is something they're capable of doing or not. And so the, the, the former that I just described is called uh, willingness to repay. This, the latter is ability to repay. There's you know, volumes and volumes of machine learning work that we've put in that many others in the industry have put in. There's also the lingua franca of credit, the FICO score, and it works very well for a lot of people that kind of look like the central casting consumer and works for a lot of people, doesn't work for somewhere between 11 and 12 million Americans who are unbanked, underbanked, basic credit invisible whole bunch of Americans who are like me, immigrants, doesn't really work particularly well for students, doesn't really work particularly well for folks that work gig economy jobs where they have multiple concurrent um, revenue sources for themselves. And just going through the process of figuring out exactly what predicts ability and willingness to repay for all of those underserved demographics is what gave a firm the advantage. Huh. That's, that is really very interesting. Um, I'm going to switch topics a little bit to something that was in the news yesterday, which is that Amazon said that it was going to stop accepting um, Visa credit cards in the UK. Um, and Amazon began working with a firm uh, earlier this year. I'm curious what you make of the Visa news with Amazon. These are giants of industry that I'm sure have a very, very multifaceted relationship. So certainly not for me to interpret beyond what's publicly visible. Um, I do think that traditional financial service providers, and th this is less to do with Visa and, and the networks, but more to do with actual lenders, issuers of credit, which are credit card issuing banks. Um, the system is broken, and the system is broken for both consumers and for merchants. For consumers, the business model is in defined print. So if you see, well, this is a, an aside, but an important one. One of the greatest things that we have to fight as a company, when consumer sees a 0% interest offer, we have been conditioned to intuitively know it's probably not zero. It is probably too mm. good to be true. 
And as ridiculous as it sounds, that's probably true for vast majority of players in the industry, except for a firm where anytime we put a number out there that consumer decides to, to pay attention to, it is a true number. It will never change. That is our brand promise. And we've been, you know, my, my proudest stat is 10 years in operation, zero dollars, zero cents in late fees or any unexpected fees charged. And so the, the consumer is confused. The business model is in the fine print. You know you're going to get hurt somehow financially, but you probably don't have the time or necessarily the, the wherewithal to even start looking. Um, the merchant side is also unhappy and their displeasure doesn't come from it's too expensive. I don't know what, what I'm going to pay. It's more about I have no idea what I'm getting. When a consumer comes in and they drop their plastic and you know online or offline, there are a bunch of fees and you, we can quibble whether these are very expensive fees, whether they're not very expensive at all. And I'm sure both sides have their point of view. But the merchant basically says, well, I don't really know what it is that I'm paying for. It's a sort of a single cut of every transaction. It's a toll bridge. And I don't like paying for things that I'm not sure I need. A firm comes to the equation with this idea of total transparency for both sides. What that allows us to do is to say, hey, for this item, we would love for the consumer, you, the merchant, would love for the consumer to transact here. We think the compelling offer is to say, you know what, don't pay any interest. Pay for this over three years, pay not a penny of interest. There'll be no late fees, there'll be no gotchas. That will give someone the confidence and the comfort to say, okay, I will buy this. And maybe instead of just buying the dress, I'll buy the dress and the shoes. And because I feel like my spending power is very clear to me, that is something merchants are very happy to pay for because this results in incremental lift. And I think the disputes, and th this is not the first nor the last dispute in the payment industry vis-a-vis -vis retailer world. You know, I've, I've been in this industry long enough to have seen many, many versions of, of these conversations. It's the notion of, I'm not sure I'm paying for the value that I'm getting. Sometimes the consumer would only transact if this particular payment type was available, but maybe they would transact even without this payment type. And our answer to this from the very beginning was, we'll give you total visibility into what's going on, merchants and consumers. That's why we tend to win these very, very important partnerships because the transparency is facing both sides of the conversation. And whenever there is a fee to the merchant, which we certainly charge as well, they know exactly what they're getting. And typically it's a happy consumer that feels compelled to buy and spend perhaps a little bit more than they normally would. Oh, that's, that's really interesting. Um, and I mean, you pointed out so many things that I think a lot of consumers can, can relate to around uh, the not trusting the 0%. Um, Coming back briefly to uh, to what I mentioned that Affirm has been working with Amazon uh, since earlier this year, um, you know, Amazon has gotten into a lot of different, uh, you know, financial services um, and obviously has a lot of data on its customers as well. Um, how concerned are you about Amazon essentially copying your business model? You know, I think... I am no more concerned about Amazon copying my business model than I am concerned about any competitive challenges out there. I think Amazon picked us as did Walmart, as did Shopify, as did you know many, many thousands now of our merchant partners because we are very good at what we do. Credit and credit in a transparent, high moral ground way, which is you know fundamentally what we are. We're not just a credit provider. Our net promoter score is you know, rivaling the likes of uh, Starbucks and Tesla, and these are beloved consumer brands. That is what we aspire to do. We wanted to be the credit provider that you love to tell your friends about, not the, you know, I don't really want to talk about my credit rating, which I can relate to <laughs> too intimately. And uh, that is the, th that, that is what we built. And so, so long as we're able to maintain that extreme customer obsession to borrow a phrase from Amazon and the attendant approval rates and repayment rates and that promoter score, I'm not too, too worried. It's very hard to do. And it is hard enough to do where a specialist like a firm is a great partner to have as opposed to you know, a, 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 an example to copy. Ultimately, if you are the best at what you do and uh, you provide a good service at a great value to your merchant partners, I don't think they have any incentive to displace you with a homebrewed solution, especially if it economically makes less sense. Quick question on cryptocurrency to end. Um, when is, is a firm going to begin accepting payments in cryptocurrency? So we have announced and are now piloting, so you may even have it in your app if you're one of the uh, chosen few beta testers. Uh, 
cryptocurrency as a way to store value. I'm a big believer in crypto as an asset class, whether I'm skeptical of the payment side, which I'm often quoted on or not, notwithstanding, it is the best performing, one of the best performing asset classes in the last decade. And so regular folks, just the kind that we serve all day, every day, deserve access to it as a way to build wealth, to save, to invest. And you have to do, you have to be very careful about it. This is not investment advice. Don't buy cryptocurrency just because uh, I, I said something something along these lines. But I do think it's intelligent. And you know, registered investment advisors everywhere now are saying things like, ah, maybe a handful of points of your personal net worth in crypto isn't such a bad idea. You know, go back a couple of years ago, it's like, ah, cryptocurrency, that's crazy. Volatility off the charts. Volatility is still off the charts, but it appreciates. So that is our view of uh cryptocurrency as a thing for a firm to to offer to its and and consumers as a payment mode you know I'll wait for this is probably a detour but uh, I think stable coins is the way to go there and uh, I'm not entirely sure what that'll look like but I do know that US regulators and legislators have to speak to this and, and one of the ultimate things that we have to decide as a as a nation is what is our plan and what is our play for creating a digital dollar. I mean, ultimately, we want to remain the reserve currency of the world. For that to happen, there has to be a true digitization of the dollar. For that, as a, an important choice, an important set of decisions, will naturally drive the cryptocurrency as legal tender. And it may have to be crypto dollar or a, one of the existing stable coins. And so that, that, that's the shorthand of my views on that one. But for now, you can use your firm savings account, or you will soon be able to use your sa firm savings account to store a little bit of crypto. And hopefully uh, reap the, uh, the appreciation. Well, that is very much the future of money. Um, Max, that is all the time we have for today. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk. It's been really interesting. Thank you for having me. I enjoyed it. And I'll be back in a moment with our next guest, Ishwar Prasad. Please stay with us. You probably think Visa is a credit card company, huh? but it's actually a network. Connecting just about everyone to just about everyone else. It can open eyes with a cup of coffee and change minds about what makes a business a business. And it is working to connect everyone, everywhere. So, meet Visa, a network working for everyone. Hello, I'm Ruth Umo, Editor-in-Chief of The Filament, and today I'm joined by Melissa McSherry, Senior Vice President and Global Head of Risk and Identity Solutions at Visa, to discuss the digitization of transactions and subsequent efforts to protect financial data. Welcome, Melissa. We are excited to have you at today's Future of Money event. Welcome. Thank you so much, Ruth. I'm ecstatic to be here. Great, great. Well, before we dive in, can you tell us a bit about your role at Visa, as well as the company's approach to payment security? Yeah, uh, so I run our risk and identity solutions team, and that means that uh, we work with um, partners uh, in financial services, with merchants, with a lot of different technology providers, uh, with really the goal of making sure that every good transaction is processed correctly, that every bad or fraudulent transaction is stopped and that it all happens with zero customer friction. Melissa, as consumers increasingly shift to making online payments and purchases, fraudsters seem to be getting more creative and more unpredictable. How has the pandemic reframed the challenge of combating fraud on Visa's massive global network? Well, you know, you're absolutely right. Fraudsters are innovators too. And uh, the pandemic accelerated what was already a shift into digital. Uh, so in a digital context, you know, we're, we're often trying to actually answer a different question than we are in a face-to-face -face transaction. And in face-to-face, -face, we're really trying to make sure that the card that's being used is a legitimate card. But in digital, the question we're trying to answer is, is the person on the other side of this transaction actually who they say they are? Um, so, you know, one of one of the big differences for us is all of this online activity, whether it's payments or, or other kinds of activity, um, you know, starts starts to come online is, are we dealing with who we think we're dealing with in the transaction? 
Well, to that point, AI can be a hugely useful tool in cybersecurity, and it's one that many companies are already leveraging. But with that being said, many companies also need to approach AI with caution. What do you view as, quote unquote, good, a good AI outcome, and why might this be different for different people? Yeah, it's such a great question because I, I do think that what is a good AI outcome starts with just what is a good outcome from the system that the AI is supporting. And in fraud, that can be different for different people. You know, some people would prefer that all fraud is stopped because, you know, they don't want to worry about um, having to talk to their bank about it or about the money that's going to, you know, might be flowing to sort of dark uh, to the dark web and and uh, to criminal interests. Um, other people might look at fraud prevention and say, hey, I'd like to stop as much fraud as I can, but I want all of my legitimate transactions to go through. And so those two those two people would actually view um, a good outcome somewhat differently. I tend to look at this through the lens of, let's do the best job we can of separating good transactions from fraudulent transactions so that we get the most amount of fraud prote protection for the least amount of uh, customer inconvenience. Yeah, Melissa, you presented in dichotomy, which I think then begs the question, at Visa, how are you striking that balance between model accuracy and fairness? You know, the, the, it starts with um, really what is our what is our overall goal and how do we make sure that the the AI, the AI, mo the AI models that we're building are ultimately supportive of um, uh, of the goals that as a company we have, which, you know, are themselves supportive of fairness. So for instance, you know, the visa vision is to um, enable individuals, businesses, and economies to thrive. And we want to make sure the tools and the products that we're providing ultimately support that. And that making sure that those models and those uh, systems are fair um, is critical to that. I, I think the key thing is uh, when we have more accurate models, we can enable those models to be used within systems that are themselves um, well-tuned for fairness. And we can educate both our the people building the models and our clients on how to use the tools in a way that, that uh, promote not only accurate outcomes, but also fair outcomes. Absolutely. Well, exactly. Melissa, as you've already highlighted, uh, the proliferation of online payments has certainly spurred questions over cybersecurity and privacy and will require that companies keep pace with the growth of digitization. Melissa, thank you again for your insights. And now back to the Washington Post. Hello, and welcome back to Washington Post Live. For those just joining, I am Christina Passariello, the technology editor here at The Post. My second guest today, Ishwar Prasad, recently released a book about today's topic, aptly titled The Future of Money. In the book, Ishwar, who is a professor of economics at Cornell and a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, makes a forecast about the dangers of crypto and how technology has had an outsized impact on financial markets. Ishwar, welcome to Washington Post Live. Thank you for having me, Christina. It's a pleasure. Well, we're very excited about this conversation. Let's start right where um, my previous conversation with Max left off, which is around cryptocurrency. Um, how did we get to this place where crypto, which is you know unregulated currency not backed by the U.S. dollar, became so popular among consumers? You know, Christina, in finances and anything else, timing is everything. Um, remember the dark days of September 2008 when we had the Lehman moment in the United States when it looked like the collapse of Lehman Brothers might bring down the entire U.S. financial system down with it. Well, just six weeks later. 
a white paper that is essentially an electronic paper uh, was posted on a website announcing the creation of Bitcoin. And it was a very alluring proposition at the time. The notion that you could have a medium of exchange that would allow you to conduct financial transactions without revealing your true identity, it's just using a digital identity, and without having to use central bank money or um, any traditional financial institution such as a bank. At the time, trust in governments, central banks, and even traditional banks was at a low ebb. So this idea really took hold at the time in the form of Bitcoin. Since then, of course, we've come a long way. Bitcoin was initially used essentially um, to fuel illicit activities on the dark web, but it has now turned into something completely different. It's become a speculative financial asset, but it's given birth to a whole range of cryptocurrencies that have different functions and that are trying to parcel out the different functions of money. I mean, it's it's fascinating. And one thing that has been kind of incredible to see is the explosion in interest uh, in cryptocurrencies, you know, just in 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 the past year, um, you know, a study out earlier this year showed that 13 percent of Americans bought or traded cryptocurrency over the last year. So I'm curious to hear from you. What does this, you know, increasing interest um, in cryptocurrency say about what consumers want from money? So at the moment, I think there is um, um, a requirement um, that many consumers have that they would like to have easy access to a low cost digital payment system. And the idea of trying to do this using an asset that might gain in value is certainly a very attractive proposition. Now, the technological element, of course, um, is very cool, um, admittedly, and that seems to have drawn in a lot of people. Uh, so let's take Bitcoin again. Um, one of the reasons why people seem to think that Bitcoin will hold its value is because it's going to be scarce. Um, there is a computer algorithm that determines how Bitcoin are created, and there is a very set schedule. Only one Bitcoin can be created every 10 minutes, and ultimately there are going to be only 21 million Bitcoins. Now compare that with US dollars, which the US Central Bank, the Federal Reserve, can print essentially at will. And indeed, in order to support the economy over the last very difficult 15 years, um, the Fed has been printing enormous amounts of money. So Bitcoin adherents argue that because Bitcoin is scarce, while fiat currencies like the dollar issued by a central bank can essentially be uh, produced in infinite quantities, Bitcoin is going to hold its value much better. But unfortunately, the reality is that Bitcoin has not worked well in the purpose for which it was intended. That is, as a medium of exchange for conducting financial transactions. Why is that? Because Bitcoin has very volatile value. Certainly, its price has been rising over time, but it's been very volatile. In addition, it turns out that Bitcoin cannot directly process a huge volume of transactions. Uh, it can process at most a handful of transactions per second compared to say millions of transactions per second on the Visa network. It's also somewhat cumbersome to use. But interestingly, uh, therefore, Bitcoin has become a pure speculative financial asset that people are not using for transactions, but holding it because they believe it will increase in value. Now, there is a risk here that people are buying into Bitcoin because they're taken in by the technological razzle-dazzle and don't fully understand the technology because after all, there is nothing backing Bitcoin other than investors' faith. One can certainly argue that even gold is uh, born in terms of value by nothing other than investors' faith. But it's certainly something that I would worry a little bit about as an investor, the fact that there is nothing other than investors' faith underpinning it because there is no intrinsic value in Bitcoin in terms of its use. But there are many other cryptocurrencies coming up that are serving as better payment technologies that have more stable value. And ultimately what Bitcoin has started is a revolution that could ultimately revolutionize how we conduct banking, how we conduct financial transactions, how we buy a house, uh, a car, without necessarily having to go to financial intermediaries such as lawyers, accountants, and so on. So there is big change coming in finance. I mean, it is it is just fascinating. You mentioned the volatility, um, the risks. What advice would you give to consumers, uh, you know, who are interested uh, in investing in a kind of in in some kind of cryptocurrency uh, to understand what the risks and benefits are? So investors ought to trade very warily. Now, of course, um, 
the reality is that uh, when I started working on my book four years ago, it seemed to me like Bitcoin was a phenomenon that could not possibly persist forever. If I, instead of writing the book, bought a few Bitcoin at the time, I'd be a much richer man by now. But I <laughs> worry again that this is a, a phenomenon uh, that could draw in a lot of uh, retail investors who don't fully understand the risks. And in history, there have been many, many examples of these speculative manias that have lasted for a fairly long time, drawn in a lot of investors. But I worry in particular about the retail investors, people who have put their entire life savings into cryptocurrencies, um, many people who even borrowed in order to invest in cryptocurrencies. Now, one might say at one level, perhaps having cryptocurrencies as a small part of your portfolio is not such a bad thing. Maybe if you hold one or two percent of your overall portfolio in cryptocurrencies, even if a cryptocurrency that you invest in crashes in value, it's not going to be a huge loss and maybe you have some upside potential. But I think certainly um, if you're a retail investor uh, who cares about safety, you need to be a little cautious about these uh, investments. Now, there are some new cryptocurrencies that have emerged um, in the wake of uh, um, uh, Bitcoin. For instance, Ethereum is the second largest cryptocurrency by market capitalization. It turns out that Ethereum potentially could have much more uses. Um, the technological platform on which Ethereum is traded is called uh, um, uh, a blockchain. And the Ethereum blockchain compared to the Bitcoin blockchain is a lot more efficient in terms of processing transactions and there is going to be an upgrade of that blockchain soon that could make it a lot more um, efficient than bitcoin and in addition a lot of these new financial products and services that you've probably heard about as being created on the blockchain are in fact being created on the ethereum blockchain not on bitcoin which is not as functional a blockchain so perhaps ethereum will have true value and then there are cryptocurrencies called stable coins. Stable coins are an interesting type of cryptocurrency. They get around the uh, problem of unstable value essentially by holding reserves of fiat currencies such as the dollar. So when one unit of a stable coin is issued, it is issued against the backing of a reserve currency like a US dollar. Now there is a delicious irony here because the whole point of Bitcoin was to get away from fiat currencies like the dollar and stable coins, which are very effective payment mechanisms, are in fact getting their stable value from being backed up by fiat currencies. But there is this proliferation of cryptocurrencies for different purposes, and consumers really need to think hard about what it is that the value proposition offered by each cryptocurrency is. That's uh, it's fascinating. And as you mentioned there, um, the stable coins, uh, in your book, you build an argument for why the end of a fiat currency is imminent. So tell us a little bit about that. How is that going to affect consumers? So I argue that the end of cash, that is the physical dollar bills that we have uh, in our wallets is imminent. And the reason for that is digital payments are proliferating around the world. Um, if you look at many advanced economies, such as say Sweden, the use of cash has almost entirely disappeared. Even in developing countries such as China and India, it's very easy to get access to low cost digital payments. In the US actually, we're somewhat far behind on these dimensions. So you and I, Christina, can use Apple Pay on our phones in order to make most of our payments, but you need to connect Apple Pay to a credit card or a bank account. It turns out even in the US, about 5% of the adult population is unbanked or underbanked, meaning they don't have easy access um, to these digital payment systems. So the private sector and cryptocurrencies such as stable coins are beginning to offer alternatives in terms of digital payment systems, but in addition, Many central banks are contemplating issuing digital versions of their own currencies. So Japan, China and Sweden are already experimenting with central bank digital currencies or CBDCs. The Bahamas has already issued the world's first nationwide CBDC, the sand dollar, and the Fed will soon be releasing a paper laying out its position about a digital dollar. Now, digital dollar essentially will provide an alternative to cash. Even economies that are considering issuing CBDCs talk about it coexisting with cash. But the reality is that if everybody in an economy has easy access to a very low cost digital payment system, that's actually kind of good for consumers as well as businesses. It reduces transaction costs. You don't have to deal with the hassle of handling cash. 
cash is susceptible to loss, theft, counterfeiting. So digital money or digital payment systems can be much more effective in terms of getting around those problems. But it's not without some costs. You know, I still uh, tip my Uber drivers and coffee baristas with cash because the tangible element creates a personal connection, which I think is nice. Cash certainly gives us privacy in our financial lives. And, you know, we have very little privacy as it is right now. And if we were to give up cash, that would mean the last vestiges of financial privacy we have may be gone. And cash is also used a lot by, um, you know, the elderly who may not be digitally savvy, um, the poor who may not have access to digital uh, um, technologies, um, the people living in rural areas who don't have easy digital connectivity. So losing cash will mean giving up um, some of these aspects, but I think that's the reality we face. The era of cash really is coming to an end uh, much faster than I think many of us had anticipated. Well, that is that is fascinating, and and you mentioned how uh, you know to use many of these digital payment systems, you need to be you need to have your phone connected to your bank or your credit card. So this is actually a very good segue to one of our audience questions. Um, Jim from Missouri asks, does the future of banking involve banks? And if so, in what role? That is a very good question, Jim. Uh, we are beginning to see a lot of the traditional functions of banks uh, being undertaken by technology platforms. So um, if you are a saver, Jim, and I wanted to borrow money from you, maybe I don't need um, to have you put that money into a bank deposit and for me to then borrow from a bank. We can find ways to connect through technology platforms more directly. Um, so entrepreneurs, um, you know, companies can all find much easier ways of getting credit, of getting access to saving instrument. If you think about payments, um, uh, sooner or later, I think Visa and MasterCard are going to have their business models challenged by um, privately issued cryptocurrencies and perhaps even digital versions of fiat currencies. And in fact, we could be in a world where each of us might have access to an account with the central bank, such as the Federal Reserve. And then the question becomes, are we going to prefer to put our money there because that might be seen as a safer to, a place to put money than even a commercial bank. So I think commercial banks face some significant threats to their business models. Commercial banks also make a lot of money from international payments, which are still very um, expensive because they involve multiple currencies, multiple institutions. Um, there again, technology is turning out to be uh, providing a lot of efficiencies. You can now make international payments much more um, uh, cheaply, quicker in a way that you can track in real time. So many of these areas that were very profitable for commercial banks are disappearing. But do we really want to live in a world without commercial banks? I mean, we may not like the large banks and what they do, but the reality is that in most modern economies, they actually create a lot of money. Anytime they make loans, they create corresponding deposits. So not having commercial banks around may actually end up hurting all of us uh, a good deal. So much as we may detest big banks, uh, they still play an important role in economies. And if they were to disappear, I think we'll have to think very hard about what takes their place, whether uh, financial systems can still work effectively in terms of creating credit and so forth. You know, in, in my earlier conversation with Max Levchin, uh, we spoke about how uh, his company is trying to correct for some of the inequalities that have been created around, you know, the credit scoring system and people who um, are unbanked. Um, you've said that crypto is likely to widen the wealth inequalities that already exist in the U.S. So I'm curious, what are the ways that we could autocorrect for these kinds of wealth inequalities um, that you argue would widen from the shift to crypto? You know, Christina, it can cut both ways. The technology that Bitcoin has bequeathed to us in the form of blockchain may actually have a lot of benefits in terms of increasing financial access, making it much easier for all of us to have easy access to low cost digital payments. Um, after all, um, many central banks are thinking of issuing uh, digital versions of their currencies precisely because they face a lot of competition from cryptocurrencies and other new private currencies um, that are emerging. So that would actually be very good in terms of improving financial inclusion. That is bringing more people into the formal financial system by giving them access not just to digital payments, but also to act as a portal for basic banking products and services for saving, for investment, for getting um, credit and so forth. But there is a risk inherent in all of this. 
what we might end up is a world where because we have a huge amount of inequality in digital access or digital connectivity and also a huge disparity in financial literacy you might find for instance people who are least able to bear any risks actually taking on a lot more risks so the idea of somebody who's not um, very wealthy seeing bitcoin as the way to economic salvation putting all their life savings in bitcoin and then potentially facing large losses that is a big concern we might also be moving to a world where the government actually becomes a lot more intrusive in our economy and financial system you know if as uh, the questioner jim pointed out if you have commercial banks playing a smaller role because you now have um, a central bank digital currency then it's possible that we might look, move to a world where the central bank actually starts becoming responsible for allocating credit in the economy no central bank including the fed and i don't want that to happen but it turns out to be a realistic possibility you might also have large corporations like amazon and facebook that start issuing their own currency and becoming even more powerful than they already are and accreting even more power in those big corporations and their shareholders so it could go one of two ways either we might be in a much more glorious future where everybody can participate in the financial system where we have more equality but there is a risk that it could go the other way if governments don't put in place guardrails to make sure that there is more competition in the space and you don't have concentrated benefits I mean, speaking of guardrails, there is, you know, little regulation um, in this space so far, uh, which is the subject of a lot of debate these days. What role do you think that the SEC should play in regulating cryptocurrencies? Now, it's not just the SEC, but a whole lot of other agencies that are trying to figure out um, how best to regulate uh, cryptocurrencies. Now, at one level, my, one might say, so long as investors go in with their eyes wide open, if they know this is a very risky investment, but they're willing to take that risk, who's the government to interfere? One concern might be, given that the market capitalization of all cryptocurrencies put together um, is pretty close to uh, $3 trillion right now, that's a lot of money. If that market were to crash, could it infect the other parts of the financial system and cause the sort of problems that we saw in our financial system and economy back in 2008? I think that risk is relatively modest because um, um, so far, at least the major financial institutions are not playing a big role in the cryptocurrency market, but many retail investors are certainly very exposed. The other problem is that many of these cryptocurrencies can be used to fuel illicit activities both within borders and particularly um, across national borders. So we're going to have some sort of regulation. Now, here again, things cut both ways. If the government does in fact step in and provide some regulation, that provides more legitimacy to the cryptocurrency industry that might allow it to flower even more um, because people might start having more faith in it. But the risk here is that you end up having a whole set of products um, that are unregulated and therefore start becoming conduits for illicit activity and for reckless speculation that could end up seeping into the financial system. But cryptocurrencies are new products. So what regulators are really contending with is do they take the existing regulations and try to fit them to these new products or create a whole new class of regulations for what are essentially becoming new products and services. Uh, some sort of regulation I think is ultimately going to be needed. That may actually be good for the industry itself, but will also be good in terms of protecting consumers and businesses from any negative fallouts from them. That's interesting. Um, last question before we wrap. You started this conversation by talking about how Bitcoin was essentially born out of the 2008 financial crisis. We've gone through a lot of financial disruption in the last year and a half with the pandemic. What do you think will be born out of this financial disruption? So I think we are moving to a world where there are going to be exciting um, changes in financial markets. Um, uh, this blockchain technology that Bitcoin has bequeathed to us is really transformative in many ways. Um, as I said, we're going to be able to conduct a wide variety of financial transactions without necessarily having to rely on trusted intermediaries. Um, many more people are going to be able to access new products and services. Uh, but this does create um, um, a variety of risks related to technology and so on. And there is a very deep irony underlying the creation of Bitcoin. You know, it was really supposed to get us away from the control of society and finance by the government and by big corporations. 
Instead, what is happening right now is that central banks are considering issuing digital versions of their currencies. The big corporations are going to uh, start issuing their own currencies. Um, so we might end up in a world where the big corporations and governments are even more intrusive into our financial markets, into our economies, and ultimately into our society. Um, so there is a possibility that the revolution Bitcoin started may put us in a place which is exactly the opposite of the libertarian vision that whoever the creator of Bitcoin was had. So I'll just leave you with the title of the last chapter of my book, which I think sums it all. A glorious future beckons, perhaps. <laughs> Well, that is certainly a lot to think about. We'll have to leave it there. That's all the time we have for today. Ishwar, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a real pleasure and privilege, Christina. Thank you. Thanks again. And thank you to all of you for joining us today. I'm Christina Passariello. To check out what interviews we have coming up next, please head to WashingtonPostLive.com. Thank you. <laughs>